The Mystery of the Dog's Tooth Cliff of Unraveled Knots by Baroness Orzee. The man in the corner was more than usually loquacious that day. He had a great deal to say on the subject of the strictures which a learned judge leveled against the police in a recent murder case. Well deserved, he concluded with his usual self-opinionated emphasis, but not more so in this case than in many others where blunder after blunder is committed and the time of the courts wasted without either judge or magistrate, let alone the police, knowing where the hitch lies. Of course you always know, I remarked dryly. Nearly always, he replied with ludicrous self-complacence. Have I not proved to you over and over again that with a little reasonable common sense and a minimum of logic, there is no such thing as an impenetrable mystery in criminology? Criminology is an exact science to which certain rules of reasoning invariably apply. The trouble is that so few are masters of logic and that fewer still know how to apply its rules. Now take the case of that poor girl, Janet Smith. We are likely to see some startling developments in it within the next two or three days. You'll see if we don't, and they will open the eyes of the police and public alike to what has been clear as daylight to me ever since the first day of the inquest. I hasten to assure the whimsical creature that, though I was acquainted with the main circumstances of the tragedy, I was very vague as to detail, and that nothing would give me greater pleasure than he should enlighten my mind on the subject, which he immediately proceeded to do. You know Broxmouth, don't you? he began after a while, on the Wessex coast. It is a growing place, for the scenery is superb, and the air acts on jaded spirits like sparkling wine. The only drawback, that is, from an artistic point of view, to the place, is that hideous barrack-like building on the West Cliff. It is a huge industrial school, recently erected, and endowed by the trustees of the Woodford Bequest for the benefit of sons of temporary officers killed in the war, and is under the presidency of no less a personage than General Sir Arkwright Jones, who has a whole alphabet after his name. The building is certainly an eyesore, and before it came into being, Broxmouth was a real beauty spot. If you have ever been there, you will remember that fine walk along the edge of the cliffs, at the edge of which there is a wonderful view as far as the towers of Barchester Cathedral. It is called the Lover's Walk and is patronized by all the young people in the neighborhood. They find it romantic as well as exhilarating. The objective is usually Kirkmoor, where there are one or two fine hotels for plutocrats in search of rural surroundings, and where humble folk like you and I and the aforesaid lovers can get an excellent cup of tea at the Wheat Sheaf in the main village street. But it is a daylight walk, for the path is narrow and in places the cliffs fall away, sheer and precipitous, to the water's edge, whilst loose bits of rock have an unpleasant way of giving way under one's feet. If you were to consult one of the Broxmouth gaffers on the advisability of taking a midnight walk to Kirtmoor, he would most certainly shake his head and tell you to wait till the next day and take your walk in the morning. Accidents have happened there more than once, though Broxmouth holds its tongue about that. Rash pedestrians have lost their footing and tumbled down the side of the cliff before now, almost always with fatal results. And so, at first, when a couple of small boys, hunting for mussels at low tide in the early morning of May 5th last, saw the body of a woman lying inanimate upon the rocks at the foot of the cliffs and reported their discovery to the police, everyone began by concluding that nothing but an accident had occurred, and went on to abuse the town council for not putting up along the more dangerous portions of the lover's walk some sort of barrier as a protection to unwary pedestrians. Later on, when the body was identified as that of Miss Janet Smith, a well-known resident of Broxmouth, public indignation waxed high. The barrier along the edge of the lover's walk became the burning question of the hour. But during the whole of that day, the accident theory was never disputed. It was only towards evening that whispers of suicide began to circulate in and about Broxmouth, to be soon followed by the more ominous ones of murder. And by the next morning, Broxmouth had the thrill of its life when it became known throughout the town that Captain Franklin Marston had been detained in connection with the finding of the body of Janet Smith, and that he would appear that day before the magistrate on a charge of murder. Properly to appreciate the significance of such an announcement, it would be necessary to be oneself a resident of Broxmouth, where the Woodford Institute, its affairs, and its personnel are, as it were, the be-all and end-all of all the gossip in the neighborhood. To begin with, the deceased was head matron of the Institute, and the man, now accused of the foul crime of having murdered her, was its secretary. Moreover, the secretary and the pretty young matron were known to be very much in love with one another, and as a matter of fact, Broxmouth had of late been looking forward to a very interesting wedding. 
The idea of Captain Marston, who, by the way, was very good-looking, very smart, and a splendid tennis player, being accused of murdering his sweetheart, was in itself so preposterous, so impossible, that his numerous friends and many admirers were aghast and incredulous. There is some villainous plot here somewhere, the ladies averred, and wanted to know what Major Gubbins' attitude was going to be under these tragic circumstances. Major Gubbins, if you remember, was headmaster of the school, and what's more, he too had been very much in love with Janet Smith. But it appeared that his friendship with Captain Marston had prompted him to stand aside as soon as he realized which way the girl's affections lay. Major Gubbins was not so popular as the captain. He was inclined to be offhand and disagreeable, so the ladies said, and moreover he did not play tennis, and with the sublime inconsequence of your charming sex, they seemed to connect these defects with the terrible accusation which was now weighing upon the major's successful rival. The executive of the Institute consisted, in addition to the three persons I have named, of its president, General Sir Arkwood Jones, who, it seems, took little, if any, interest in the concern. It seems as if, by giving it the prestige of his name, he had done all that he intended for the furtherance of the Institute's welfare. Then there were the governors, a number of amiable local gentlemen and ladies, who played tennis all day and attended innumerable tea parties, and knew as much about administering a big concern as a terrier does of rabbit rearing. In the midst of this official supineness, the murder of the young matron, followed immediately by the arrest of the secretary, had come as a bombshell, and now wise heads began to wag, and ominous murmurs became current, that for some time past there had been something very wrong in the management of the Woodford Institute. Whilst at the call of various august personages, money was pouring in from the benevolent public, the commissariat was being conducted on parsimonious lines that were a positive scandal. The boys were shockingly underfed, and the staff of servants was constantly being changed because girls would not remain on what they called a starvation regime. Then again, no proper accounts had been kept since the inception of the Institute five years ago. Entries were spasmodic, irregular, and unreliable. Books were never audited. No one apparently had the slightest idea of profit and loss or of balances. No one knew from week to week where the salaries and wages were coming from, or from quarter to quarter, if there would be funds enough to meet rates and taxes. No one, in fact, appeared to know anything about the affairs of the Institute, least of all the secretary himself, who had often remarked quite jocularly that he had never in all his life known anything about bookkeeping, and that his appointment by the governors rested upon his agreeable personality rather than upon his financial and administrative ability. As you see, the captain's position was, in consequence of this, a very serious one. It became still more so when presently two or three ominous facts came to light. To begin with, it seemed that he could give absolutely no account of himself during the greater part of the night of May 5th. He had left the Institute at about seven o'clock. He told the headmaster then that he was going for a walk, which seemed strange as it was pouring with rain. On the other hand, the landlady at the room where he lodged told the police that when she herself went to bed at eleven o'clock, the captain had not come in. She hadn't seen him since morning, when he went to work, and at what time he eventually came home, she couldn't say. But there was worse to come. Firstly, a stick was found on the beach, some thirty yards or less from the spot where the body itself was discovered. And, secondly, the police produced a few strands of wool which were, it seems, clinging to the poor girl's hatpin, and which presumably were torn out of a muffler during the brief struggle which must have occurred when she was first attacked and before she lost her footing and fell down the side of the cliff. Now the stick was identified as the property of Captain Marston, and he had been seen on the road with it in his hand in the early part of the evening. He was then walking alone on the lover's walk. Two Broxmouth visitors met him on their way back from Kurtmore. Knowing him by sight, they passed the time of day. These witnesses, however, were quite sure that Captain Marston was not then wearing a muffler. On the other hand, they were equally sure that he carried the stick. They had noticed it was a very unusual one, of what is known as Javanese snake wood with a round heavy knob and leather strap, which the captain carried slung upon his arm. Of course, the matter interested me enormously. It is not often that a person of the social and intellectual caliber of Captain Marston stands accused of so foul a crime. If he was guilty, then indeed he was one of the vilest criminals that ever defaced God's earth, and in the annals of crime there were few crimes more hideous. The poor girl, it seems, had been in love with him right up to the end, and according to some well-informed gossips, the wedding day had actually been fixed. 
The unsuccessful rival, Major Gubbins, too, was an interesting personality, and it was difficult to suppose that he was entirely ignorant of the events which must of necessity have led up to the crime. Supposedly there had been a quarrel between the lovers. Sundry rumors were current as to this, and in a vague way those rumors connected this quarrel with the shaky financial situation of the Institute. But it was all mere surmise and very contradictory. No one could easily state what possible connection there could be between the affairs of the institution and the murder of the chief matron. In the meanwhile, the accused had been brought up before the magistrate, and formal evidence of the finding of the body and of the arrest was given, as well as of the subsequent discovery of the stick, which was identified by the two witnesses, and of the strands of wool. The accused was remanded until the following Monday, bail being refused. The inquest was held a day or two later, and I went down to Broxmouth for it. I remember how hot it was in that crowded courtroom. Excited and perspiring humanity filled the stuffy atmosphere with heat. While the crowd jabbered and fidgeted, I had a good look at the chief personages who were about to enact a thrilling drama for my entertainment. You have seen portraits of them all in the illustrated papers, the British Army being well represented by a trio of as fine specimens of manhood as anyone would wish to see. The president, General Arkwright Jones, was there as a matter of course. He looked worried and annoyed that the even tenor of his pleasant existence should have been disturbed by this tiresome event. He is the regular type of British pre-war superior officer with ruddy face and white hair, something like a nice ripe tomato that has been packed in cotton wool. Then there was the headmaster, Major Gubbins, well-groomed, impassive, immaculate in dress and bearing, and finally the accused himself, in charge of two warders, a fine-looking man, obviously more of a soldier and an athlete than a clerk immersed in figures. Two other persons in the crowded room arrested my attention, two women, one of them dressed in deep black, thin-lipped, with pale round eyes and pursed-up mouth, was Miss Amelia Smith, the sister with whom deceased had been living, and the other was Louisa Rumpel, who held the position of housekeeper at the Woodford Institute. The latter was one of the first witnesses called, and her evidence was intensely interesting because it gave one the first clue as to the motive which underlay the hideous crime. The woman's testimony, you must know, bore entirely on the question of housekeeping and of the extraordinary scarcity of money in the richly endowed institute. Often and often, said the witness, a motherly old soul in a flamboyant bonnet, did I complain to Miss Smith when she gave me my weekly allowance for the tradesman's books. Tisn't enough, Miss Smith, I says to her. Not to feed a family, I says, let alone thirty growing boys and half a dozen working girls. But Miss Smith, she just shook her head and says, Committee's orders, Mrs. Rumpel. I have no power. Why don't you speak to the captain, I says to her. He has the handling of the money. It is a scandal, I says. Those boys can't live on boiled bacon and beans, and not English nor Irish bacon it ain't, neither, I says. Poor lambs. The money I have won't pay for beef or mutton for them, Miss Smith, I says, and you know it. But Miss Smith, she only shook her head and says she would speak to the captain about it. Asked whether she knew if deceased had actually spoken to the secretary on the subject, Mrs. Rumpel said most emphatically, yes. What's more, sir, she went on, I can tell you that the very day before she died, the poor lamb had a regular tiff with the captain about that there commissariat. Mrs. Rumpel had stumbled a little over the word, but strangely enough, no one tittered. The importance of the old woman's testimony was impressed upon every mind and silenced every tongue. All eyes were turned in the direction of the accused. He had flushed to the roots of his hair, but otherwise stood quite still, with arms folded and a dull expression of hopelessness upon his good-looking face. The coroner had asked the witness how she knew that Miss Smith had had words with Captain Marston. "'Because I heard them to Evan words, sir,' Mrs. Rumpel replied. "'I'd been in the office to get my money and my orders from Miss Smith, and we had the usual talk about American bacon and boiled beans, with which I don't old, not for growing boys. Then back I went to the kitchen, where I remembered I had forgot to speak to Miss Smith about the scullery maid, who'd been saucy and given notice. So up I went again, and I was just a-going to open the office door when I heard Miss Smith say quite loud and distinct, it is shameful, she says, and I can't bear it, she says, and if you won't speak to the general, then I will. He is staying at the Queen's at Kirtmore, I understand, she says, and I'm going this very night to speak with him, she says, as I can't spend another night, she says, with this on my mind, 
Then I give a genteel cough and... The worthy lady had got thus far in her story when her volubility was suddenly checked by a violent expletive from the accused. But this is damnable, he cried, and no doubt would have said a lot more, but a touch on his shoulder from the warders behind him quickly recalled him to himself. He once more took up his outwardly calm attitude, and Mrs. Rumpel concluded her evidence amidst silence more ominous than any riotous scene would have been. I gave a genteel cough, she resumed with unruffled dignity, and opened the door. Miss Smith, she was all flushed, and I could see that she'd been crying, but the captain, he just walked out of the room and didn't say another word. By this time, the man in the corner went on dryly, we must suppose that the amateur detectives and the large body of unintelligent public felt that they were being cheated. Never had there been so simple a case. Here, with the testimony of Mrs. Rumpel, was the whole thing clear as daylight. Motive, quarrel, means, everything was there already. No chance of exercising those powers of deduction so laboriously acquired by a systematic study of detective fiction. Had it not been for the position of the accused and his popularity in Brocksmith society, all interest in the case would have departed in the wake of Mrs. Rumpel. And at first, when Miss Amelia Smith, sister of the deceased, was called, her appearance only roused languid curiosity. Miss Amelia looked what, in fact, she was, a retired schoolmarm, and were the regular hallmark of impecunious and somewhat soured spinsterhood. Janet often told me, she said in the course of her evidence, that she was quite sure there was roguery going on in the affairs of the Institute, because she knew for a fact that subscriptions were constantly pouring in from the public, far in excess of what was being spent for the welfare of the boys. I often used to urge her to go straight to the governor's, or even to the president himself about the whole matter, but she would always give the same disheartened reply. General Arkwright Jones, it seems, had made it a condition when he accepted the presidency that he was never to be worried about the administration of the place, and he refused to have anything to do with the handling of the subscriptions. As for the governors, my poor sister declared that they cared more for tennis parties than for the welfare of a lot of poor officers' children. But a moment or two later we realized that Miss Amelia Smith was keeping her tidbit of evidence until the end. It seems that she had not even spoken about it to the police, determined as she was, no doubt, to create a sensation for once in her monotonous and dreary life. So she pursed her lips tighter than before, and after a moment's dramatic silence, she said, the day before her death, my poor sister was very depressed. In the late afternoon, when she came in for tea, I could see that she had been crying. I guessed, of course, what was troubling her, but I didn't say much. Captain Franklin Marston was in the habit of calling for Janet in the evening, and they would go for a walk together. At eight o'clock on that sad evening, I asked her whether Captain Marston was coming as usual, whereupon she became quite excited and said, No, no, I don't wish to see him. And after a while, she added in a voice choked with tears, Never again. About a quarter of an hour later, Miss Amelia went on, Janet suddenly took up her hat and coat. I asked her where she was going, and she said to me, I don't know, but I must put an end to all this. I must know one way or the other. I tried to question her further, but she was in an obstinate mood. When I remarked that it was raining hard, she said, That's all right, the rain will do me good. And when I asked her whether she wasn't going to meet Captain Marston after all, she just gave me a look, but she made no reply. And so my poor sister went out into the darkness and the rain, and I never again saw her alive. She paused just long enough to give true dramatic value to her statement, and indeed there was nothing lukewarm now about the interest which she aroused. Then she continued. As the clock was striking nine, I was surprised to receive a visit from the headmaster, Major Gubbins. He came with a message from Captain Marston to my sister. I told him that Janet had gone out. He appeared vexed, and told me that the captain would be terribly disappointed. What was this message? The coroner asked amidst breathless silence. That Janet would please meet Captain Marston at the Dog's Tooth Cliff. He would wait for her there until nine o'clock. The man in the corner gave a short, sharp laugh, and with loving eyes contemplated his bit of string, in which he had just woven an elegant and complicated knot. Then he said, now it was at the foot of the dog's tooth cliff that the dead body of Janet Smith was found, and some thirty yards further on the stick which had last been seen in the hand of Captain Franklin Marston. Nervous women gave a gasp and scarcely dared to look at the accused, for fear no doubt that they would see the hangman's rope around his neck. 
But I took a good look at him then. He had uttered a loud groan and buried his face in his hands. And I, with that unerring intuition of which I pride myself, knew that he was acting. Yes, deliberately acting a part, the part of shame and despair. You, no doubt, would ask me why he should have done this. Well, you shall understand presently. For the moment, and to all unthinking spectators, the attitude of despair on the part of the accused appeared fully justified. Later on we heard the evidence of Major Gubbins himself. He said that about seven o'clock he met Captain Marston in the hall of the Institute. He appeared flushed and agitated. The witness went on, very reluctantly, it seemed, but in answer to pressing questions put to him by the coroner, and told me he was going for a walk. When I remarked that it was raining hard, he retorted that the rain would do him good. He didn't say where he was going, but presently he put his hand on my shoulder and said in a tone of pleading and affection, which I shall never forget. Old man, he said, I want you to do something for me. Tell Janet that I must see her again tonight. Beg her not to deny me. I will meet her at our usual place on the Dog's Tooth Cliff. Tell her I will wait for her there until nine o'clock, whatever the weather. But she must come. Tell her she must. Unfortunately, the Major continued, I was unable to deliver the message immediately, as I had work to do in my office, which kept me till close on nine o'clock. Then I hurried down to the Smith's house and just missed Miss Janet, who, it seems, had already gone out. Asked why he had not spoken about this before, the Major replied that he did not intend to give evidence at all unless he was absolutely forced to do so as a matter of duty. Captain Marston was his friend, and he did not think any man was called upon to give what might prove damnatory evidence against his friend all of which sounded very nice and very loyal, until we learned that William Purrier, Batman at the Institute, testified to having overheard violent words between the headmaster and the secretary at the very same hour when the latter was supposed to have made so pathetic an appeal to his friend to deliver a message on his behalf. Purrier swore that the two men were quarreling and quarreling bitterly. The words he overheard were, You villain, you shall pay for this. But he was so upset and so frightened that he could not state positively which of the two gentlemen had spoken them, but he was inclined to think that it was Major Gubbins. And so the tangle grew, a tangled web that was dexterously being woven around the secretary of the Institute. The two Brocksmith visitors were recalled, and they once more swore positively to having met Captain Marston on the lover's walk at about eight o'clock of that fateful evening. They spoke to him, and they noticed the stick which he was carrying. They were on their way home from Kirtmore, and they met the captain some two hundred yards or so before they came to the dog's tooth cliff. Of this, they were both quite positive. The lady remembered coming to the cliff a few minutes later. She was nervous in the dark, and therefore the details of the incident impressed themselves upon her memory. Subsequently, when they were nearing home, they met a lady who might or might not have been the deceased. They did not know her by sight, and the person they met had her hat pulled down over her eyes and the collar of her coat up to her ears. It was raining hard then, and they themselves were hurrying along and paid no attention to passers-by. We also heard that at about nine o'clock, James Hoggs and his wife, who live in a cottage not very far from the dog's tooth cliff, heard a terrifying scream. They were just going to bed and closing up for the night. Hoggs had the front door open at the moment and was looking at the weather. It was raining, but nevertheless he picked up his cap and ran out toward the cliff. A moment or two later, he came up against a man whom he hailed. It was very dark, but he noticed that the man was engaged in wrapping a muffler round his neck. He asked him whether he had heard a scream, but the man said, No, I've not, then hurried quickly out of sight. As Hoggs heard nothing more or saw anything, he thought that perhaps, after all, he and his missus had been mistaken. So he turned back home and went to bed. I think, the man in the corner continued thoughtfully, that I have now put before you all the most salient points in the chain of evidence collected by the police against the accused. There were not many faulty links in the chain, you will admit. The motive for the hideous crime was clear enough, for there was the fraudulent secretary and the unfortunate girl who had suspected the defalcations and was threatening to go and denounce her lover, either to the president of the institute or to the governors. And the method was equally clear, the meeting in the dark and the rain on the lonely cliff the muffler quickly thrown round the victim's mouth to smother her screams, the blow with the stick, the push over the edge of the cliff. The stick stood up as an incontestable piece of evidence. The absence from home of the accused during the greater part of that night had been testified by his landlady. 
whilst his presence on the scene of the crime sometime during the evening was not disputed. As a matter of fact, the only point in the man's favor were the strands of wool found sticking to the girl's hatpin, and Hogg's story of the man whom he had seen in the dark engaged in readjusting a muffler round his neck. Unfortunately, Hoggs, when more closely questioned on that subject, became incoherent and confused, as men of his class are apt to do when pinned down to a definite statement. Anyway, the accused was committed for trial on the coroner's warrant, and of course reserved his defense. You, probably, like the rest of the public, kept up a certain amount of interest in the cliff murder, as it was popularly called, for a time, and then allowed your mind to dwell on other matters and forgot poor Captain Franklin Marston, who was languishing in a jail under such horrible accusation. Subsequently, your interest in him revived when he was brought up for trial the other day at the Barchester Assizes. In the meanwhile, he had secured the services of Messrs. Sharton and Inglewood, the noted solicitors, who had engaged Mr. Provost Boone, K.C., to defend their client. You know as well as I do what happened at the trial, and how Mr. Boone turned the witnesses for the Crown inside out and round about until they contradicted themselves and one another all along the line. The defense was conducted in a masterly fashion. To begin with, the worthy housekeeper, Mrs. Rumble, after a stiff cross-examination which lasted nearly an hour, was forced to admit that she could not swear positively to the exact words which she overheard between the deceased and Captain Marston. All that she could swear to was that the captain and his sweetheart had apparently had a tiff. Then, as to Miss Amelia Smith's evidence, it also merely went to prove that the lovers had had a quarrel. There was nothing whatever to say that it was on the subject of finance, or that deceased had any intention either of speaking to the president about it, or of handing in her resignation to the governors. Next came the question of Major Gubbin's story of the message which he had been asked by his friend to deliver to the deceased. Now accused flatly denied that story, and denied it on oath. The whole thing, he declared, was a fabrication on the part of the Major, who, far from being his friend, was his bitter enemy and unsuccessful rival. In support of this theory, William Perrier's evidence was cited as conclusive. He had heard the two men quarreling at the very moment when accused was alleged to have made a pathetic appeal to his friend. Perrier had heard one of them say to the other, You villain, you shall pay for this. And in very truth, the unfortunate captain was paying for it, in humiliation and racking anxiety. Then there came the great, the vital question of the stick, and of the strands of wool so obviously torn out of a muffler. With regard to the stick, the accused had stated that in the course of his walk he had caught his foot against a stone and stumbled, and that the stick had fallen out of his hand and over the edge of the cliff. Now this statement was certainly borne out by the fact that, as eminent counsel reminded the jury, the stick was found more than thirty yards away from the body. As for the muffler, it was a graver point still. Strands of wool were found sticking to the girl's hatpin, and James Hoggs, after hearing a scream at nine o'clock that evening, ran out toward the cliff and came across a man who was engaged in readjusting a muffler round his throat. That was incontestable. Of course, Mr. Boone argued, it was easy enough to upset a witness of the type of James Hoggs, but an English jury's duty was not to fasten guilt on the first man who happens to be handy, but to see justice meted out to innocent and guilty alike. The evidence of the muffler, argued the eminent counsel, was proof positive of the innocence of the accused. The witnesses who saw him in the lover's walk on that fateful night had declared most emphatically that he was not wearing a muffler. Then where was the man with the muffler? Where was the man who was within a few yards of the scene of the crime, five minutes after James Hoggs had heard the scream? The man who had denied hearing the scream, although both Hoggs and his wife heard it over a quarter of a mile away? Yes, gentlemen of the jury, the eminent counsel concluded with a dramatic gesture, it is the man with the muffler who murdered the unfortunate girl. If he is innocent, why is he not here to give evidence? There are no side tracks that lead to the cliffs at this point, so the man with the muffler must have seen something or someone. He must know something that would be of invaluable assistance to the elucidation of this sad mystery. Then why does he not come forward? I say, because he dare not. But let the police look for him, I say. The accused is innocent. He is the victim of tragic circumstances but his whole life, his war record, his affection for the deceased, all proclaim him to be guiltless of such a dastardly crime. And above all, there stands the incontestable proof of his innocence, the muffler, gentlemen of the jury, the muffler. 
He said a lot more than that, of course, the man in the corner went on, chuckling dryly to himself, and said it a lot better than ever I can repeat it, but I have given you the gist of what he said. You know the result of the trial. The accused was acquitted, the jury having deliberated less than a quarter of an hour. There was no getting away from that muffler, even though every other circumstance pointed to Marston as the murderer of Janet Smith. On the whole, his acquittal was a popular one, although many who were present at the trial shook their heads and thought that if they had been on the jury, Marston would not have got off so easily. But for the most part, these skeptics were not Brocksmith people. In Brocksmith, the captain was personally liked, and the proclamation of his innocence was hailed with enthusiasm. And what's more, those same champions of the good-looking secretary, they were the women mostly, looked askance on the headmaster, who they averred, had woven a Machiavellian net for trapping and removing from his path forever a hated and successful rival. The police have received a perfect deluge of anonymous communications suggesting that Major Gubbins was identical with the mysterious man with the muffler. But, of course, such a suggestion is perfectly absurd, since at the very hour when James Hoggs heard the scream, and a very few minutes before he met the man with the muffler, Major Gubbins was paying his belated visit to Miss Amelia Smith, and delivering the alleged message. Even those ladies who disliked the headmaster most cordially had to admit that he could not very well have been in two places at the same time. The Dog's Tooth Cliff is a good half-hour's walk from Miss Smith's house to the Lover's Walk itself, and is not accessible to cyclists or motors. And thus, to all intents and purposes, the cliff murder has remained a mystery, but it won't be one for long. Have I not told you that you may expect important developments within the next few days? and I am seldom wrong. Already in this evening's paper you will have read that the entire executive of the Woodford Institute has placed its resignation in the hands of the governors, that several august personages have withdrawn their names from the list of patrons, and that though the president has been implored not to withdraw his name, he has proved adamant on the subject, and even refused to recommend successors to the headmaster, the secretary, or the matron. In fact, he has seemingly washed his hands of the whole concern. But surely, I now broke in, seeing that the man in the corner threatened to put away his piece of string and to leave me without the usual epilogue to his interesting narrative, surely General Sir Arkwright Jones cannot be blamed for the scandal which undoubtedly has dimmed the fortunes of the Woodford Institute. Cannot be blamed? The man in the corner retorted sarcastically. Cannot be blamed for entering into a conspiracy with his secretary and his headmaster to defraud the Institute, and then to silence forever the one voice that might have been raised in accusation against him? Sir Arkwright Jones, I exclaimed incredulously, for indeed the idea appeared to me preposterous then, as the general's name was almost a household word before the catastrophe. Impossible. Impossible? he reiterated. Why? He murdered Janet Smith. Of that you will be as convinced within the next few days as I am at this hour. That the three men were in collusion, I have not the shadow of doubt. Marston only made love to Janet Smith in order to secure her silence. But in this he failed, and the girl boldly accused him of roguery as soon as she found him out. It would be inconceivable to suppose that being the bright, intelligent girl that she admittedly was, she could remain forever in ignorance of the defalcations in the books. She must, and did, tax her lover of irregularities. She must have, and indeed did, threaten to put the whole thing before the governors. So much for the lover's quarrel overheard by Mrs. Rumble. I believe that the fate of the poor girl was decided on then and there by two of the scoundrels. It only remained to consult with their other accomplice as to the best means for carrying their hideous project through. Janet had announced her determination to go to Kurtmore that selfsame evening, the only question was which of those three miscreants would meet her in the darkness and solitude of the lover's walk. But in order at the outset to throw dust in the eyes of the public and the police, and not appear to be in any way associated with one another, Marston and Gubbins made pretense of a violent quarrel, which Perrier overheard. Then Gubbins, in order to make sure that the poor girl would carry out her intention of going over to Kurtmore that evening, went to her house with the supposed message from Marston and incidentally secured thereby his own alibi. This made him safe. Marston, in the meanwhile, went to arrange matters with Arkwright Jones. His position was, of course, more difficult than that of Gubbins. If there was to be murder, and my belief is that the scoundrels had been resolved on murder for some time before, 
The first suspicion would inevitably fall on the secretary who had kept the books and who had had the handling of the money. The miscreants had some sort of vague plan in their heads. Of this there can be no doubt. They were only procrastinating, hoping against hope that chance would continue to favor them. But now the hour had come. The danger was imminent. Within the next four and twenty hours, Janet Smith, being promised no redress on the part of the president, would place the whole matter before the governors, unless she was effectually made to hold her tongue. We can easily suppose that Marston would be clever enough to arrange to meet Arkwright Jones without arousing suspicion. We do know that soon after he finally quarreled with Janet Smith, he walked over to Kurtmore. The two witnesses who spoke with him stated that they met him whilst they themselves were walking to Broxmouth. It was then just past eight o'clock. Arkwright Jones had either dined at his hotel or not. We do not know, for it never struck the police to inquire at once how the popular general had spent his time on that fateful evening. You know what those sort of unconventional seaside places are. People spend most of their time out of doors, and there would be nothing strange, let alone suspicious, in any visitor going out for an hour after dinner, even if it rained. Then surely you can in your mind see those two scoundrels putting their villainous heads together, and as suspicion of any foul play would of necessity at once fall on Marston, Jones decided to take the hideous onus on himself. He went to the dog's tooth cliff to meet Janet Smith himself, and borrowed Marston's stick to aid him in his abominable deed. He was clever enough, however, to throw it over the edge of the cliff some distance away from the scene of his crime. We do not know, of course, whether the poor girl recognized him or whether he just fell on her in the dark. She only gave one scream before she fell. They were clever scoundrels, we must admit, but chance favored them too, especially in one thing. She favored them when she prompted Arkwright Jones to put a muffler round his throat. This one fact, as you know, saved Marston's neck from the gallows. But for the strands of wool in the girl's hat pin and Hogg's brief view of a man manipulating a muffler, nothing but Jones's own confession could have saved his accomplice. Whether he would have confessed remains a riddle which no one will ever solve. But as to the whole so-called mystery, I saw daylight through it the moment I realized that Marston's despair and humiliation during the inquest was a pretense. If he feigned despair, it was because he desired, temporarily, to be the victim of circumstantial evidence. From that point to the unraveling of the tangled skein was but a step for a mind bent on logic. But, I argued, for indeed I was bewildered and really incredulous, what will be the end of it all? Surely three scoundrels like that will not go scot-free. There will be an inquiry into the affairs of the Institute. The governors— The governors have talked of an inquiry, the funny creature broke in with a chuckle. But if you had any experience of these private charities, you would know that the first thing their administrators wish to avoid is publicity. The president of the Woodford Institute had sufficient influence on the committee, you may be sure, to stifle any suggestion of creating public scandal by any sort of inquiry. But the question of the finances of the Institute is anyhow public property now, and it will be allowed to sink into oblivion. The executive has resigned, Marston and Gubbins will leave the country, and everything will be conveniently hushed up. But Arkwright Jones, I protested. You see the papers regularly, he rejoined dryly. Watch them, and you will see. I don't know when he went, but a moment or two later I found myself sitting alone at the table in the blameless tea shop. The matter interested me more than I cared to admit, but for once I was not altogether prepared to accept the funny creature's deductions. Twenty-four hours later, however, I had to own that he had been right when the following piece of sensational news appeared in the Evening Post. Tragic Sequel to the Cliff Murder An extraordinary sequel to the mysterious tragedy of the Dog's Tooth Cliff near Broxmouth occurred last night, when on the self-same spot where Miss Janet Smith met her death three months ago, General Sir Arkwright Jones lost his footing and fell a distance of 200 feet onto the rocks below. It was a beautiful moonlight evening, and the tide being low, a number of visitors were down on the beach at the time, but those who immediately hurried to the general's assistance found life already extinct. The distinguished soldier, who will be deeply mourned, must have been killed on the spot. Indeed, now general public opinion, as well as every inhabitant of Broxmouth, will bring pressure to bear upon the borough council to see that a suitable barrier is erected along the dangerous portions of the beautiful Lover's Walk. The double tragedy of this year's season renders such an erection imperative. 
I was probably the only reader of that paragraph who guessed that the once distinguished soldier had not come accidentally by his death. No doubt the police had followed up the clue of the man with the muffler and were actually on the track of the miscreant when the latter, guessing that exposure was imminent, preferred to put an end to his own miserable life. I have since heard from friends at Broxmouth that Marston has gone to the Malay States and that Gubbins is doing something in Germany. Curious creature Marston must have been. Imagine, after Jones had returned from his infamous errand and told him that the hideous deed was done, imagine Marston walking back to Broxmouth along the lover's walk in the rain and the darkness past the dog's tooth cliff at the foot of which the body of the murdered girl lay. I wonder what would be the views of the man in the corner on the psychology of a man with nerve enough for such an ordeal. End of the Mystery of the Dog's Tooth Cliff